so tenderly and washed my eyes with tears that I might see. Thank you, fellas, for that beautiful song today. Many of us have read the Palm Sunday story time and again down through the years. But there's an aspect of it that I felt a burden to especially bring to our attention this morning. And so I'm lifting two verses of scripture, just brief verses, but ones that speak immediately to the subject at hand for me today. First of all, from 19, Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. And then John 11:35, it may ring a bell quickly with you as the shortest verse in the Bible. So say it with me. Jesus wept. There are a lot of beautiful and awe-inspiring mountains in the world. From the Himalayas to the Alps to the Rockies, mountains have their own unique way of pointing us to God. However, there's no more important mountain related to both past and future events in human history than the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. It was there on the eastern slope that our Lord made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem over the palm branches a few days before his crucifixion. It was on this mountain that scripture records for all of posterity the weeping Christ. On the eastern slope of the mountain in the village of Bethany, he wept over our sorrows as we read there in John 11. 35. On the western slope on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem, he wept over our sins, the sins of mankind. Many believe that Palm Sunday is about pomp and circumstance and the celebration of the hour. For after all, people were shouting, they were waving their palms, they were placing their garments in the way, and Jesus was passing over on the donkey. But I'm here this morning to tell us, no, it is not fully that. Palm Sunday is about tears. Palm Sunday is about weeping. It's about crying. You know something? We've raised a generation or two of people in the Western world who have lost their tears. Our culture has taught us in many ways that it's inappropriate to cry. You could go back through history and come up with songs that have been hits like uh, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. And Big Girls Don't Cry. We tell our sons, oh, be a man, suck it up, don't cry. One of the major problems facing our culture today is that we have lost our tears. A brilliant ophthalmologist shared the medical truth that crying is a part of an important release valve in many people. Crying may even be a chemical release for emotional stress. The doctor said that tears actually release a chemical that relieves stress. And that's why we often feel better after we cry. Probably many of us can attest to that today. Tears have a medicinal effect. You know how sweat pours out of our body on a hot day when we're going about our duties. And, and, but what's it doing? It's keeping our body cool. It's doing something for us. Tears flow to release the stress of the soul, like sweat, the sweat of the body. 
And so, as the Lord stood at Lazarus' tomb, he was saying to us, it's okay to cry. It's okay. In fact, God is the one who gives us the tears. He's created us that way. When we think about it, there are no other animal species who cry with emotional tears. Dogs do not cry. Turtles do not cry. Cats do not cry. But we do. We humans do. There are things that impact us. Oh, I know animals have their emotions and and all. We, We can't deny that. But I'm talking about the emotional crying. Tears are a gift of God. And Jesus is telling us this Palm Sunday that it's okay to cry. In fact, if you've been like me as we see what is happening across our world and what's happening among our people, it's brought tears to my eyes. I've had emotional letdowns, moments, when I'm just praying and asking God, Oh God, help us through this. Help our people through this. You know the burdens they're carrying. You know the stress of the moment and the time that we're going through. You're saying to us, it's okay to cry. Today, I hope to etch into your memory the picture of the weeping Christ. Jesus wept. Think about that. Some are too proud to cry. Others haven't cried in years. And still others have lost their tears. They're gone. But not our Lord. Jesus wept. There are two times in Scripture that record his weeping. We've read them to you. Both of them are found on the Mount of Olives, once on the eastern slope. When he wept over our sorrow, he's touched by our broken hearts. The other on the western slope, when he wept over the sins of mankind, he's troubled by the blinded eyes of man, blinded toward sin and blinded toward ungodliness. His tears speak volumes to us today. and So let's listen to what his tears are saying. First of all, Jesus is weeping over our sorrows. He's touched by our broken hearts. We read in John 11, verse 33 to 35, Therefore when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? Or where have you laid Lazarus? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. The event was the funeral of his dear friend, Lazarus. Note when the Lord wept, he wept when he saw Mary weeping. When he felt her emotion, when he saw what she was going through, tears touched the heart of God. And they still do today. Mary's heart was broken. Her brother was dead and Jesus was too late. She had no hope. She was hurting. And when our Lord arrived on the scene, he saw her weeping. And Jesus uses an interesting word to describe Mary's weeping. The word means deep sobs. It means wails. And Mary was pouring out her soul to the Lord. And our Lord had come from a place where there was no sin. He came from a place where there was no sorrow. He came from a place where there were no tears. There were no tombs, there were no hurts, there were no heartaches, there were no pandemics. And now he walks upon the scene and he sees Mary, he sees her crying, he sees her tears, he hears her deep, loud sobs that Lazarus is dead. When our Lord saw Mary crying in such a fashion, There were two things that happened. The Bible says that he groaned in spirit and he was troubled. Imagine the Son of God. And as our Lord stood at the tomb of his friend, he was indignant at what sin had done resulting in death, resulting in sorrow. And in his restraint, 
He groans and he's troubled. The text tells us that what really got him was Mary's tears and caused the cause behind her heartbreak. Jesus knew the real deep problem was sin. The real deep problem was death. It brought such great pain. And to this day, it still brings such heartache and pain into the lives of people. Now with appointed brevity, John simply writes, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in all the Bible, but perhaps one of the deepest verses in all the Bible. Mary was upset. Our Lord knew that better than anyone. And so what would he do? What's he supposed to do to her right now? Give her a speech? Come on, Mary. Get over it. It'll be all right in a month from now or a year from now. No. Was he to give her a lecture? Was he to give her a rebuke? Was he to try to encourage her? No, the Bible says Jesus wept. She wept and he wept. The tense of the verb tells us that he just couldn't hold it in. It was a spontaneous response to the burden she was carrying, to the grief of her soul. It was just a spontaneous expression of love. No wonder we read in the scriptures that he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. <laughs> it touches me to think that the Lord is not a spectator to our pandemic. He's not a spectator to our sorrow. <laughs> He's borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. He knows what COVID-19 is doing to us. Some men might think that it's not good to be seen crying. However, I believe that great men are not afraid to shed tears. To let something impact them deep within. The Apostle Paul himself reminded those at Ephesus that he had been serving the Lord with all humility and with tears. We read of it in Acts 20 and 19. And to the Corinthians he said, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. That's the Apostle Paul. In the early days of the Salvation Army, when it was a great missionary force in England, a young man assigned to a particular city, labored and labored and labored, and finally he wrote back to headquarters with a telegram that simply said, have tried everything, ready to quit. General William Booth wired him back with two words, try tears. <laughs> And you know what? Tears move the heart of God. Solomon reminds us in Ecclesiastes 3 and 4 that there's a time to weep. If you need God's attention, try tears. Try tears. The psalmist told God to put our tears in your bottle. That's translated from Psalm 56 and verse 8. Put our tears in your bottle, God. And you know what? I believe he does that. Not one of your tears falls unnoticed, nor are they forgotten. Tears speak louder than words. Tears have a language all of their own. 
They need no interpreter. Any of us who have raised children know that to be true. <laughs> wow. What the tears of a child can do to your soul. What they can do to your emotions. Any of us who held our husbands or our wives in a, in a time of tears, we know it to be true. Nothing moves the heart of God like, like tears. And let me remind you that he has no trouble deciphering between what is real and what is fake. He knows the difference. So just bear your heart to him. Surrender your life to him. Give him your emotions. He'll bottle up your tears. We have to give them to him. It's okay to cry. In the Old Testament, King Hezekiah was about to die and he was told to get his house in order. The Bible tells us that he prayed and he wept and God replied, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. And yes, tears touch the heart of God. To the government, you may feel like you're only a number, a social security number. But you're somebody to God. The same Lord Jesus who saw Mary's tears and wept with her. He stands by your side today. And he's saying to us across the centuries that it's okay to cry. He's touched by our broken hearts. But secondly, I want us to notice that Jesus is weeping also over the sins of mankind. He's troubled by our blinded eyes. If you have sin in your life, he's weeping over you today, my friend. But it's not to no avail. Good things can happen. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, as we've read, when Jesus drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. And I would ask you today, do you get the picture a few days after the experience in Bethany on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives? Jesus finds himself on the back of a donkey making a triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. The city... The scene is filled with all the excitement of the cheering crowd. They're waving their palm branches. And most Palm Sunday messages in, in most churches are about the parade and about the pep rally. And I've, I've preached that many a time. It certainly has its place. But all of that ultimately was a sham. And our Lord knew it. For within five days... They would all be gone and their cheers would be turned to jeers. Can you picture him on this Palm Sunday morning? He's the center of attention. One would say he must have had a smile on his face. He was riding on the back of a donkey. Like we would see today somebody riding on the back of a convertible in a parade. Everyone was partying. Everyone was was waving, everyone was shouting their hosannas. Jesus is the, the subject of their adoration. But he's weeping. Hear him through his tears. As he says in Luke 19, verse 42, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now... They are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Those crowds wanted a Stormin' Norman Schwarzkopf. Remember those days? They wanted a George Washington who would ride into town and put down the Roman opposition. And thus when they did not get what they wanted, their cheers were turned into jeers. And less than a week later, they crowned him a king, all right, but with thorns. They stripped him of his garment. 
They beat him until his back was a bloody pulp. And then they asked, are you the king of the Jews? What a joke, they thought. And they laughed, and they laughed, and they laughed. The Bible says they laughed him to scorn. He was a king, all right. But his kingdom was not of this world. His was a kingdom of our hearts. And so our Lord Jesus sat, sat on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible tells us that he wept. He wept. These were different tears than the ones he shed that we read about on, in Bethany a few days earlier. In Bethany, the Greek word used to describe Jesus weeping was, was only this one time used in the New Testament. It means to shed tears in such a fashion that we weep silently. You know what that's like. You get a lump in your throat. You feel it within, deep within. Maybe a tear or, or two would spill out of your eyes. And that's what happened with Jesus at the grave of Lazarus. However, on Palm Sunday, we are told that he wept. And the Greek word here is different. These are the same deep sobs that we find Mary using in John eleven thirty three. This is also the word used to describe Simon Peter when he wept bitterly after the rooster crowed and reminded him of his denials. So look at this Palm Sunday road. Look at our Lord. Look at the people cheering. They're waving their palm branches, but he broke down and cried with sobs that could be heard a block away, no doubt. Yes, it's Palm Sunday and Jesus is still weeping over mankind's sins. He is still troubled by our blinded eyes. He is still saying, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. The church in the Western world today does not seem to be weeping over the sins of the people. We do not seem to be troubled by blinded eyes. We're watching the decay of a civilization before us. You think back to a few years ago when some of us were kids. Used to read about shootouts that happened in Dodge City. But today we read of them happening in school buildings across our land. A few years ago when I was in school, the problem students were those who talked out of turn. The problem students were those who were chewing gum in class. The problem students were those who were running in the halls and cutting in the cafeteria line, littering on the school grounds. Those days are gone. Today the problems are drugs and teenage pregnancies and suicides and guns, as well as extortions and robberies. This is America of the 21st century and Jesus is still weeping. And if we viewed our cities as our Lord sees them, we would see them through our tears. The problem with the church today is that she's lost her tears. Oh, we might still cry in an emotional movie or when our dog dies, but the de-Christianization of our culture does not seem to affect us like it should. And as we wave our palm branches on this day, put them in your window or whatever practice you're doing in these unique circumstances that we're facing, does this story tell us anything about ourselves? Is there anything in our lives that might cause our Lord to weep? Is He saying to any of us how often... How often I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. Are we like some of them shouting and supporting and waving our palm branches as long as we get what we want? Everything is good. Even in the midst of our own Palm Sunday, our Lord may still be weeping over us. He may still be troubled by our blinded eyes. 
And Jesus is still weeping over our, our sorrows. He's touched by our broken hearts. Just as he wept with Mary, he's touched by our tears. Jesus is still weeping over the sins of the world. He's still troubled by the blinded eyes. And just as he said to those on the Palm Sunday road, he says to us today, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. Does our Lord weep with you today? Or does he weep over you today? That's the question, friend. Is he pleased with your life? There's a big difference between whether he weeps with us or weeps over us. He weeps with us in our sorrows and over us in our sins. And he will see us through our sorrows. I promise you, he'll see us through. But he can deliver us from our sins. He can deliver you from the sins that are perhaps a part of your life. You don't need to go on enslaved by sin. In fact, nothing, nothing would make him happier than for you to repent of your sins and turn from your sins, forsake them, and follow Jesus. The last time tears are mentioned in the Bible was in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. And what a scene we get of heaven from those words, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And I would submit to you this morning that that is the hope of Palm Sunday. Yes, in the days of dusk and in the days of darkness and in the days of COVID-19, remember that God preserves all of your tears in a bottle. Why? Why? I believe it's so that one day, at dawn, He will wipe away all tears from our eyes. They'll be forever gone. They'll be forever behind us. Perhaps the psalmist David said it best when he said this in Psalm 30 in verse 5. For His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Join me in singing this chorus together as we conclude our service this morning. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning, weeping only lasts for the night. Hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning, the darkest hour. Is just inside. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping only lasts for the night. Hold on, my child. For this service that we've been able to enjoy together. Thank you for each one's participation. Most of all, we thank you for your presence, for your anointing, for your spirit that has rested upon us today. Oh God, I pray that you instill within us 
a deeper resolve, a passion and compassion, a, a sensitivity to the Spirit of God and to the needs that are all around us, especially for that one who needs awakened to the sin in their life, that they would turn and repent of it and find victory through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh God, stir our hearts and help us and encourage us this Palm Sunday. And we'll praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And again, we appreciate you joining the Lebanon God's Missionary Church today.